Stakeholder engagement, um, much more powerful in stimulating change than regulation. If every corporation that you're studying is a corporate mansion, so DTE is worth 12.3 billion, at the top of that mansion, people can see the financial disclosure because of the SEC requirements, the 10K, the 10Q, uh, the definition of materiality is changing as we speak. Because of environmental regulation, you can see most of the middle of the corporate mansion. Right? You can see into their pollution, their toxics, their impact. And because of the nature of their giving under the philanthropy laws, folks like my firm can also see a lot of what they're disclosing. What you can't see, unless you try and focus on it, is what are the major stakeholders saying about your firm, right? And those would be the investor groups like TIA Cref. They would be Dow Jones SAM. They would be some of the German valuation groups. So my firms have developed models trying to think how those eight valuation firms think about a firm. So that's investor relations stakeholders, right? Don't only think of regulatory stakeholders, think of investor relations stakeholders when you're thinking what changes a company. Any questions about that before I give you a specific, just like I did on Shore and DTE? Yes, ma'am. Looks like you have a question. Okay. Have you all studied stakeholder engagement here? I don't see it in many MBA programs. I've been to Stanford MBA recently, in Seattle, Manchester, in England. Look up the guy's name. His name is Bill Shireman, S-H-I-R-E-M-A-N. He has a, a not-for-profit called the Future 500. He and I, he works for Nestle and Coke. I share three clients with him, Suncor, FMC, and Freeport McMoran, a $212 billion golden mining company. And I'm learning a lot from Bill Shireman in the last 10 years. He has a group of 40 people, and they are expert at helping multinationals scope out and map their stakeholders. The logic of growth of a firm is more predetermined today by stakeholders than by regulation. And so I think you should begin to study about relationships, right? Remember I told you relationships and reputation are more important than revenue? That's definitely true in the modern corporation. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. So if you go to ahcgroup.com and look up stakeholder engagement, you'll see that in November 14 and 15, we're bringing 22 of the world's largest companies in the world, Exxon, Disney, you name it, Conoco, to San Francisco for our third annual training on stakeholder engagement. Another example of how these firms can't learn about this stuff in business schools they have to learn about it from each other, right? Because this is a very, very significant development. In a world of transparency, in a world of global accounting disclosure, in a world of Superfund where your contingent liabilities are disclosed, disclosed with great detail, the world can look into a corporation more than ever before. And so a corporation will act on a change to its product or on a change to its manufacturing strategy, its distribution strategy, even its price strategy based on what stakeholders are saying about them. Right? So to make it concrete to you before I go, we're working on a $400 million a year project between item two and item three called COSIA. And I recommend that it took us two years to get 13 CEOs to sign off on this. The 13 CEOs are the CEO of Exxon, which came on 14 days ago, the CEO of Shell, the CEO of my eight-year client, Suncor Energy, and it all involves oil sand development, right? Which is the most controversial stakeholder issue in the world today. If you interview anybody who's less than 30, 93% of them are against it. If you then tell those 30% of the 30-year-olds that they're already using 17% of oil sands in their car when they drive to school, they still hate it, okay? So there's a real recalcitrant issue regarding oil sands development. 
So looking at stakeholder engagement issues and looking at emerging issues like climate change, we decided, and I have to take very little credit for this, it was more Suncor Energy's leadership, we decided that the only solution was to create a 36 university agreement in which 13 CEOs gave 400 million a year to figure out how to do soil recovery faster in the tailings ponds, how to reduce the greenhouse gas impacts of oil sands development because it's a five-step process, how to reduce the amount of oil consumed in the act of finding oil, how to reduce the amount of performance waste through fugitive gas emissions, how to reduce the use of water. So we are the firm, just like we helped Toyota go to the hybrid powertrain over four years, which increased market share from 8.2% global market share to 10.1%. We are in the process of influencing these 13 oil giants based on stakeholder engagement and emerging issues management. So whoever thought that in one life you could get the attention of 13 CEOs, right? Let alone Exxon, which is notoriously anti-brethren type oil company. If you know anything about Exxon, you know that they are supreme in operations and maintenance. They have the best intellectual property in the world. They are the largest in the world. And so my job was to profile the 192 people in Irving, Texas that run Exxon, find the three that would say yes, and have them join COSIA. So that's the type of work that I do, right? And it's very complicated, but a lot of fun. Emerging issues management, big dollar stuff, right? Climate change. How many of you think you'll be working in firms after you graduate that have some of their growth constrained by climate change? Who, who, can you tell me who you're working for or who you intend to work for? Uh, I'll be doing real estate. Um, nobody can take over. No, but LaSalle is a great group. I, I know their CFO. I was with her in Wall Street 10 days ago. Totally committed to figuring out how to reduce the climate impact of real estate deals. So that's a state of the art for them. One of the biggest real estate entities in the world. We were also meeting in Wall Street with BlackRock. Uh, Anybody know who BlackRock is? Sir in the back, who's BlackRock? In the green shirt. It's a big institutional investor, I guess, private equity, venture capital, anything you can think of. Uh, I know the head of governance for TIA CREF. I've worked with him for 10 years. Uh, a lot of my retirement funds are in TIA CREF. 4.4, 404 billion dollars, TIA CREF. BlackRock is seven times larger, very concerned about climate change investment. Largest asset manager in the world. Uh, if you look up the name Chip Splinter, he's the guy that you want to apply for jobs with because he's building a staff right now. And he's the head of governance at BlackRock. So the things we're talking about here are not peripheral to business anymore. I think that they're front and center to business. And that's why I continue to come to business schools to talk to them because I think that this is an issue of the near future. And it's more likely to impact your careers um, more uh, aggressively and with uh, significant reshaping of your careers um, than, say, my career. So that's why it's uh, worth talking about, I think. In the end, corporations are run by the alignment of only three things, and that is money, people, and rules. Those three things describe most likely what you're going to do working in, right? A human resource or a talent cultivation person, people. Um, rules, accounting rules, right? Regulatory rules, rules of the supply chain, contract agreements, right? And then, of course, the biggest one, money. So at one point in my firm when we were growing very rapidly, I tried to figure out what percentage of the people are actually decision makers within a firm and what percentage of the people are decision support. Let's, before I go on to this last one of strategic planning and governance and innovation, 
It's really important to come to a working model in your head about what percentage of a corporation is decision support versus what percentage of it determines the direction, strategy, and innovation path of the firm. Now, of course, it's different for any industrial sector, right? So we work for Masco, and we work for the head of innovation of Masco, who's one of the top 15 officers, Gary Yesbeck. Masco owns Delta Faucets, it owns Bear Paint, it owns 200 brands. They have a larger percentage of their people involved in real decisions than most corporations, right? So I already told you at in Irving, Texas, Exxon, only 192 of their people make the decisions, right? At, at Masco, it's almost 50 for a firm that's only 15 billion, right? So you, as a management consultant, you have to figure out who make the decisions. So what's your guess, anybody in the room, as to what percentage is decision support and what percentage has to do with strategic planning, governance, and innovation? I think it's a good thing to have in your mind as you proceed in your career. In my experience, it's less than 10% of the people that can actually make a decision. 90% of the people are involved in decision support. That doesn't mean that someday they won't be promoted to a decision maker. In fact, it's the hope of most of us that in the second or third decade of service, we will be one of that 10%. But if you read Directors and Boards magazine, or if you read all the innovation literature, or if you read about strategic planning, such as John Cotter's great book from 1996, Leading Change, there is an assumption that if you're going to make change, you focus on that top 10% and you let it trickle down. So I want to tell you a few sustainability stories about how millions of dollars were made by my client, FMC, some of it approaching billions of dollars based on focusing on the top 10%. Just so you can visualize this as you enter the future because most of the people that we were hired to make change didn't have the word sustainability. They had MBA type titles to them. So they were procurement officers, they were IT people, they were human resource people, they were specialists of decision support within the firm, but their French chairman, Pierre Bondreau, had read one of my books and he wanted me to make the firm grow in the direction of sustainability. And this was easy to do because he had a really smart global procurement number two by the name of Mark Douglas. And both of them had already tried it out before when they ran Raman Haas and sold it to Dow. So often you want to go into a firm where the leaders have some history of change and they know that you can actually change. So when we found out that FMC owned 13.4% of the world's seaweed and that they owned the dominant lithium mines in the world, it made perfect sense that they were going to compete on sustainability. Because as we run out of petroleum, we have to shift chemistry to bio-derived chemicals, right? That is an inevitable thing that will happen in the next 15 years of your career. Because already, when you start working for Hess and when you start working for the Cosia companies like I do, you can say for certain that the proven reserves are decreasing about 4.5% annually for the last six years. So Hubble's predicted bubble of decline of oil is real. And it's actually manifest. And the reason why we get into big $25 billion liability problems like the BP spill, is that we're pursuing higher risk oil. And we're also pursuing dirtier oil, like much, much of Chevron's portfolio. And if you just look as an investor at any of these oil companies, you will see that their reserve numbers are steadily declining. There is the rare exception of oil sands. So the reason why I'm telling you this story is that FMC looked at that triangle that I started this lecture on and said, Bruce, put a five-person team together. We need you to coach us in each of these five points. Now, that was delightful, because usually we get employment in just one or two of the areas, not all five, right? But those are the ways you change a company. You reduce their risks. The escalating price of oil is a real risk to chemical companies. About 28% of Dow's profitability is tied into the cost of natural gas right now, right? So these things are things that 
you can learn pretty easily by reading the paper. You don't have to have advanced degrees. So risk mitigation, strategic planning, emerging issues, stakeholder engagement, leader to leader. I'm going to flip to the other slides unless you have questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for being here. I have a quick question about the pressure points, because you're talking about stakeholder engagement. And I was wondering how you see consumer pressure as an aspect of the stakeholder engagement. It's a great question. That's going to change in the future, because more and more people have ask, uh, um, access to CSR reports, for example. They're easy to read for everybody, so that they know exactly what programs are doing. Yeah. Are you Dutch? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been to a third of the world's largest cities in my management work, and the Dutch people began asking about consumer capitalism, consumer-based capitalism, about 22 years ago. John Elkington began thinking about it from a British perspective when he wrote his book, The Green Consumer, about 20 years ago. And John Elkington, who's a colleague of mine, is the man who invented the phrase triple bottom line. His newest book is Zero Ganats, meaning that there will be stakeholders in the world soon who have zero tolerance for error, right? So to answer her question, there is a 22-year history of people anticipating the emergence of consumer-based capitalism. And um, it is a development, and it is a significant change. So if you look at the web pages of, say, the great conflicts of corporations right now, Home Depot versus Lowe, right? GM versus Chrysler, Toyota. Um, if you look at those great conflicts, a lot of it is they're doing an advanced consumer profiling, Coke versus Pepsi. They're actually engaged in social network debates right now, which you can follow on any of those companies' web pages, to try and figure out, is there any leverage points on consumer behavior? So to dig a little deeper into that great question from your Dutch colleague, when I got hired by Toyota, we already knew that the average buying unit of a car had 57 variables. It's scientifically achieved. Everybody knows that. Toyota knows that. GM knows that. Chrysler knows that. Ford knows that. Of those 57 variables, sustainability is probably close to the bottom. Fuel efficiency is probably close to the bottom, right? Um, up top is color, torque. Uh, a factor that you can study called drivability. All of these things are benchmarked. And when I worked for Toyota those five years, every single meeting started with a benchmarking spider chart where we knew exactly where we were competing. There are some firms that believe that consumers are going to change the product family, and there are many that don't. So I could tell you definitively, Toyota, when we were there when they changed their mantra to today, tomorrow, Toyota. Saatchi and Saatchi was sitting at the table of 14 that I was with each week on 957th Street in New York. Uh, a boutique branding group called Oasis was there. Uh, $30 million a week were being spent on this effort. And what's really cool is some of the companies get it. Even a manufacturer like Toyota believe that consumers will influence the near future buying patterns. Right? Now, it's probably hard for you to see that because consumers are really remote from how a corporation behaves, right? But that is another trend that I think is happening. Most of the companies I work for don't really get it. And they don't see it happening. These are some of the firms we work for. This is what I want to sum up at this point, because there is something about the human mind that thinks it's right. And there's something about history that proves most of the time we're wrong, all right? And so what's beautiful about survival as an intellectual is it's very much like baseball, where the people who make as much money as I have in my life are satisfied knowing that most of the time we're going to be wrong, right? And history is going to tell us how to redirect our effort.